excuse me, sir. Um, where was I filming originally? By the way, we're on. So um, I was doing it at different locations. Like I was doing it at a studio and. Oh, okay. Because yeah, I've seen I've seen some of the episodes. Okay. and they've been in like different spots. So yes. that's what. Uh, I've done an episode in the new Pouch Six Studio that's inside of Collective. Yep. The one I did with Tess Miller. Yes. Um, and then. Dakota Meyer would be the most recent one that I did inside of the Squatch Frontier Fitness, their radio room. Cool. I've done multiple over there. Okay. Yeah. And then I guess season one, girl, I don't even like, they're all over the map. But uh, the the audio or the ones that were recorded on Riverside that were remotes. Yeah. Those were like from the house I lived in before. Obviously, the guest is wherever the heck they are. So yeah, it's all over the place. How fun. But here we are. Here we are. Conversations. Okay, guys. Um, conversations with Claire. I know a girl, I was at the gym doing sauna cold plunge right before this because I'm like a contrast therapy junkie and I accept that. Um, and there are worse things that you could be junkies for. I don't know if you know enough about my history, but like I have that too. So <laughs> yeah. Bad joke. No, what, no it's, fine. it's fine. I'm like, there are worse things, girl. We're really good at making fun of ourselves. <laughs> You're good. Same. Um, <laughs> No, it actually, uh, it's, it, I remember the very first time I did cold plunge was years ago now. And it was actually, I guess, shortly after I got sober, which I just celebrated three years, by the way. Congrats. So, thank you. And so I guess it was like between two and three years ago anyway. And I did it and I did it purely because I was just training like a maniac at that time. And I just needed like any physiological aid possible. Yeah. And your, your history tells me that you're abundantly familiar with those seasons of life too. For sure. And so I did it and I was like, I came out and I was like, guys, nobody told me that I was going to really enjoy this from the perspective of like, I'm a little high right now. Yeah. And this is a safe container for that sensation. So thank yeah. you for uh, not informing me. But now, so I recommend it to people in recovery all the time. I'm like, contrast therapy is amazing to give you like a safe high. Yes. Anyway. Okay. I was talking to a friend about that because like any, any sort of addiction, right? Like I feel like. I don't know. It's just there's huge breakthroughs that happen in cold plunges. Yeah. So like people okay, cry. Wait, I'll, I promise I'll introduce her here in a second. We'll get there. Um, I'm the orange kicks are everything to me though, uh, and I've encouraged this behavior. So if anybody's like her feet are up, how dare she? I like said please do that. So can you explain? It's because I'm so tall, you guys. I, here's what I look like if I don't do it. I look like a little kid or like a, like a giant in a ch a children's <laughs> chair small. in a doctor's like one of we those like put doctor a, like, office stack of chairs books under me. Yeah. <laughs> Like I, yeah, it's like my knees, are, I just feel like my knees are to my chin. So we're just six, four trying to fit where we can. I feel like we're like that song, like get on my level. Like I'm trying to get on your level right now. I don't know. Anyway, I'm trying to get on your level. Okay. So I guess I could leave them down if it's rude. It's not rude. It's great. I think you should keep it up. <laughs> um, okay. So what were you saying to your friend? about contrast therapy <laughs> it's so bad. i'm sorry i'm just gonna have Put it them up. Yeah. yeah i'm just gonna have it like here okay she's wearing cool kicks they need to be in the frame yeah this main <laughs> character energy <laughs> Golly. Yeah. um no i was just saying that i have gone on retreats where people will just start crying mm. you know like in the cold plunge, in the cold plunge yeah. yeah have you ever done any breath work yes those ones will get you those ones are crazy you have like visions and yeah that I mean yeah there's a lot of magic I I went to I I'm truly looking forward to going down that rabbit hole more yeah um by the way I announced two episodes ago that rabbit ears um need to be like props you know how people have like tinfoil hats and stuff that they yes. use yes so they're actually they might be delivered while we're recording and if so maybe we'll just bring them in yeah <laughs> they're Try on out we are literally I'm gonna like probably put a pouch back here and just have some props and like when we go down rabbit holes we can just put the ears on absolutely Wait, I love I'm that. I'm sorry, I'm not breaking these out with you. I was hoping they'd be here by now. I'm all in. I'm all in for the costumes. <laughs> you will pause and yeah. go get them. Oh, um, but, okay, I'm excited to do more work with the breathwork stuff. Yeah. I had a tremendous amount of fear around it because I saw people have, like, these intense reactions to it. And being in recovery, like I want to be in control, you know, like yeah. I don't want to feel out of control. I did that for 15 years. I don't want to feel out of control anymore, you yeah. know? And so, uh, had a friend like go to this place that's actually, it's called comfort zone Fridays and it's like free in a park. It's super cool. And it's bite-sized breath work is how I would describe it. So it's enough that you can like 
see what you think and it doesn't feel too crazy and it's not too much like yeah. volume of it or intensity and so that was great and then I've had some other exposures and but it, you just see the videos of people like losing it and yes. so I thought that that was what was going to happen but I will yeah. say I was just doing one of those chill ones and I'm laying there and then all of a sudden I'm like oh I'm codependent with my mother <laughs> huh 31 years old just found that out thanks Ooh. and mind you she's wonderful love her yeah. dearly so we've talked about this and I'm like this is it's okay this is a me thing yeah <laughs> it's not you it's me it's not you it's me um, yeah what okay what have you do you mind have I just I think like we forget to breathe mm -hmm. you know what I mean like we forget how important breath is mm -hmm. And we just forget to do it consciously. And that was like one of the first things to exist, right? Is like, you know, God breathes life like mm -hmm. that. It's so important and we just forget to do it. And so I think our bodies are miracles. And when we do things with intention and consciously, like there's just so many little God winks, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, I don't do it as often as I used to. I was doing it like 10 minutes every single day. And I had like this, um, specific breath work I was doing mm -hmm. and yeah, it was just crazy. One time I was it in, somatic or was it transcendental or do you even know? I don't even know. Okay. It was just, uh, my, I had a few friends who were doing it, like, so I have a friend who does breath work. Um, we're in Austin. We all have a friend who does I breath know. Work. Well, she's actually doesn't live here. She lives in California. So okay. same, same, but yeah. So I have a friend who does she'll that. Here, so. Yeah. She'll be here. She lived with me for like three months. So, um, but she does it. And so, and originally it was from a friend and he just like gave me like, here's a beginner thing. And I did it. And, uh, yeah, I had like a full on vision of like a bear and a hunter. Like I, had a full on vision. And then I came to like drugs. No. Okay. Just wondering <laughs> if you had, I was like going to be like, how did you compare it? <laughs> was it the same vision? Yeah. For the record, I've done those and I have not had the same experience with breath work. I enjoy the experience with breath work much more. Oh yeah. I didn't feel like I was, it was out of control at all. It was almost like a, wow, that was a really neat little message that I yeah. received, you know, like it wasn't some crazy yeah. thing, but I still like when I, kind of woke up from it I was like what the heck just happened like that yeah. was pretty wild yeah so do you know Rachel Haig by chance no okay well you'll have to know her after this she <laughs> created she's so cool I, she's the podcast episode that came out yesterday and she goes to Red Rocks as well anyway Cute. um she jokingly made a comment about like on the episode about like getting her Austin swag pack after moving here and like how, you know, like the breath work and the contrast yes. therapy and the whatever. Yeah. And I was like in the community and I was like on the floor dead Yeah, because I'm like, I've never heard it described as the Austin swag pack, but boy, if that isn't the truth. No, it is. You'll okay, see. So what do you get in your, in your swag pack? Um, <laughs> cause like, you're not from here. Are you? No, I'm okay. from Montana. We're going to go there. I swear. Yeah. <laughs> We're still, we're still going to introduce me. Don't worry. Yeah, we'll anyway, get, we will get there. <laughs> um, Austin swag. I just like try not to get into the crazy stuff, yeah. but like the conscious community, like the, what is it? The spiritual. I think they call it new age. Yes. I new age or the spiritual. Oh, you know what I'm talking about? I don't, I know. I understand. I just, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we're the spiritual guys who are like. Hey, you know, like, I just think that you're projecting a lot and I need to do some breath work and I really feel like I need to go do some contrast therapy before we can have this conversation kind of stuff. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> One of my friends slash clients calls it the, and he's like a gentleman in his fifties uh, now, and he calls it like the fake Austin shaman and he oh. sends them to me online and boy, if it ain't just outright funny. No. Yeah. They're funny. Anyway. Okay. Uh, so today, oh, I didn't ask you how to, Ketty. Ketty? Yes. yes. Jen Ketty is on the podcast. Hi. So now that we have just rambled for who knows how long, but uh, enjoyed it thoroughly. Yeah. She is, I'm going to do your intro now. Oh, so. <laughs> this is exciting. Well, 
it, okay, it comes from your Instagram, but, I, but then I also just put my own little touches on it. So oh, okay. one, she is the water wizard, which we'll get into that later, but that's like a self-proclaimed, yeah. that's funny. Yeah. Um. So we'll explain. She is a six-figure sales coach. Yes. Casual. Uh, she is a professional volleyball player. Cool. Cool. Hence this. Would you say six, four? Yeah. Yeah. She tall girl. Um, and let's see our cancer warrior. Yeah. I saw that note and I did not know whether or not that was you personally have had cancer and survived. Uh, yes. Okay. We're going to get into that. Okay. For but sure. I was like, is this a fan? That's okay. Gosh, there's going to be so many nuggets of gold in here. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. You are a walking comedy show. That's mine. Um, <laughs> <laughs> also self-proclaimed. <laughs> <laughs> Claire proclaimed. <laughs> and, and unless you proclaim it too. And then, you I know do. What? I tell people proclaim I'm a comedian. It. Yeah, And they're are. like, really? And I'm like, I mean, no. But that was my initial immediate, like, th- that's what that is. Okay. <laughs> and then you are also a content creator. And you didn't have that on there, but that is definitely something that you do. And it's just such a vibe. And so I'm going to touch on that later. But I think the cool thing to note now is that I, when after meeting one another in person and then going and seeing your social media, what I see is just like, you're the creator everyone wants to be. And what I mean by that is that like, I feel, I know, right? (laughs) I'm serious guys. If you Uh, love me, just say that. (laughs) Okay. I love you. (laughs) But you show up just yourself. Right. And so I have like questions about that later. Um, but that's just because I think we all want to follow creators that are real humans Yeah, and that, that have their quirks and have their like things that they excel at, that they share how they do that. And that's wonderful. And then also have their real human moments. And I think that you don't, it just comes across so just naturally and like, uh, anyway, so, uh, I love following you. Thank you. Um, yeah. So, uh, how we met is because our friend, our mutual friend, Zach Rushelow, Yeah. He introduced us. So we literally, he and I were training at the gym that you guys are members at, at Collective. And you came in and you were training across the room. And he was like, I have to introduce you to her. You two need to know one another. <laughs> oh, he said that? Yes. I didn't know that's how that came about. Yes. Like he literally was like, y'all, like the two of you, y'all got to <laughs> meet. And I will say it's funny because the like, he's a pretty good connector. I think. Yeah. Yeah. And so we come over and chat with you. Um, and I hope I might be paraphrasing, but that's how I recall it occurring. And if my boyfriend likes to remind me of anything, my recollection is not always the most accurate, but that's how I recall it. So anyway, (laughs) and what I feel about myself is I'm like a, like a human, like labradoodle. Like I just want to play. Like, yeah. yeah. And and you were immediately like, I'm down to play. (laughs) So (laughs) So we ended up talking for 30 minutes and I did not work out. That's, that's literally, we were just, I just remember laughing and I was time. like, okay, well, I'm, I don't want to work out anymore. <laughs> I don't even remember what the heck we talked about, but I know that I loved every minute of it. I just blacked out. <laughs> anyway, do you have anything to add to that? Or are we good? Do we feel no, like that, that was, like- that was, that's very accurate actually. Yeah. 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 Okay. So let's now go back. You grew up in Montana. I want to get some context about you as we dive deeper into yeah. your stuff. So like you're from Montana. I'm from Montana. Technically, I was born in California okay. in Sacramento, and I lived there until I was seven. Okay. And my parents were divorced. Divorced. Mm-hmm. My parents were divorced when I was six months. Had brothers and sisters. Anyway, when mom got remarried, we moved to Montana. Okay. And so that's pretty much where I went to school. Was raised. I definitely say I'm like okay. I was born in California. If we're gonna get technical, mm-hmm. raised in Montana. Where in Montana? Missoula. Okay, I love Montana. Really? Yeah, it's beautiful. It's it's like the last best place. Yeah. I love it so much. It's a little small for me to live right now. Mm. Like I feel like my personality is just although with the internet, I feel like I could make it work. Yeah, yeah. like I could thrive and be social on social media. But it's just like a little small for me right now. I feel like it's such a creepy thing to say, but I'm like I need to touch humans. Yeah, that's it's such a creepy thing. No. <laughs> so I need a mixture. I need in both. like a healthy, consensual yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. consensually. Yeah. yeah. No, but I totally get it. Like I love meeting new people. Yeah. And it's just like everyone who lives there's lived there the whole lives. You know what I mean? What's the size? So Missoula is where the university, like the biggest university in Montana, is right. University of Montana is in Missoula, and yeah. then you have Montana State and Bozeman. 
Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. they're not far from one another on the no. map at all. No. And so that's like the most densely populated portion of the state of Montana is right there. I would, And yeah. yet, what is the population of Missoula? Do you know? I think it's like 76,000. Yeah, so like the biggest city is that. Well, I think Bozeman's the biggest. But either way. Um, yeah. Billings. Speak about the, yeah, that's the, Billings is pretty big. I got to spend some time in Montana a few years ago. Um, and almost moved there like I, I i loved well predominantly billings but then i also just like took a road trip and just be bopped through yeah. all those little towns yeah. but i did do this like it we called it like hot springs tour in the like middle of winter where we just yep. like d- took a van for like a week and went to all these different hot springs in all over the like south west corner which is where the yep. majority of stuff is uh and it was so cool like snow biked it was an epic adventure yeah um and because that was so great i'm like i think i should move here but i am also grateful that i didn't because well it's frozen yes <laughs> a lot of the time most of the time yeah so i don't know i i'm with you and like it's such a beautiful landscape i think that yeah the and and the friends that i had that lived there were definitely like hey guys don't come here <laughs> yeah like don't move here yeah. no that's the energy that you receive for sure okay so is volleyball like a big thing there no not at all they didn't even have like club volleyball when I was playing so I played indoor and I actually I mean it was such not a thing if that even makes sense that I my parents drove me three and a half hours to practice every weekend so that I could play for a team in Washington Spokane Washington so that I could like actually play high level volleyball and get recruited and go to college how young were you when you started to play volleyball I think I was like uh, I think I started in seventh grade when you're kind of just like what's happening and I don't remember if I was good or not mm-hmm. super tall obviously I was say, did they purely just pick it because of your height like well we yeah. need a sport that height is an advantage in yes okay that's a funny story actually I was a big soccer girl I loved soccer uh-huh and they always just made me play goalie. So I started to hate it, but I still loved soccer and I played it since I was four. Mm. And so when I got to high school, my parents were like, so soccer and volleyball are the same season. And I was like, okay. They were like, so we think you need to pick a sport that your height benefits you basically telling me that like you're playing volleyball. And I was like, oh, I'm not going to do either. Now I'm going to be a cheerleader because I was so pissed that they told me that I had to play volleyball. Really? Yes. So I went on orientation to sign up to be a cheerleader and I literally got to the table and I was like, hi, is this where I sign up? And they literally were like, (laughs) yeah. And as soon as that happened, I was like, oh, okay, I'm not supposed to be here. (laughs) And yeah, they called me and I did not call them back. So I did end up playing volleyball. Okay. So did you always enjoy playing volleyball? I was obsessed with volleyball. Okay. Cause I feel like that's the vibe I get today. Yeah. So literally obsessed. I, in high school, it's all I wanted to do. It's all I did do. I did not do school. I don't recommend that for anyone watching. Um, it's all I wanted to do. I played by myself off of my parents' roof. Like just, I would just like pass set and then spike it onto the roof and let it roll back down for hours wow. on end. I would do that. Yeah. Yeah. So you, so you're doing that through high school and then you, and you let me know if there's any other pit stops that you feel like are going to be noteworthy, um, that we have not yet made as we go along the journey, (laughs) the journey that is volleyball (laughs) is your life. Um, but okay. So you start playing in seventh grade. You're abundantly aware that this is the thing that you love so much to do. Yes. And so you knew that you were good enough that you were going to go to college for it like the whole time. Like that wasn't in question. I didn't. I like, I just was so naive to even the fact that you could play volleyball in college. Like I just loved volleyball and my freshman year of high school, the university of Montana started recruiting me and I was like, Oh wow, this is a real thing. And I like wanted to go on the Olympic team and all this stuff. Those were my goals. And so, yeah, I, I just started getting recruited a lot and but I didn't have the grades lessons because I didn't do school Mm. so I couldn't go to like the University of Oregon's or the Cal's or you know those kinds of schools so I ended up going to Cal Poly which is so funny because it's such an academic school I like that like volleyball is like eh people go there to be engineers and doctors and scientists yeah California right yeah Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo okay it's such it was so hard 
it was so hard because same thing. I wanted to play volleyball. Like, uh-huh. why do I have to go to school to play volleyball? Right. It was gnarly. So, okay. But it was fun. It was great. My coaches were great. Um, it was a journey for sure. How many years did you play? I was there for five years. Okay. So I redshirted injury uh, my junior year, something like that, uh-huh. going into my senior year. So I was there for five years. Okay. And you got a degree? I did. What degree did you I get? I did graduate. It's Recreation, Parks, and Tourism Administration with a concentration in sports management. <laughs> it's a mouthful. And it's so that funny. For you. Like everyone's no, that's like. cool. Why? Why? No, it was so cool. I just think it's funny because people are like, oh, Cal Poly, that's a big engineering school. And I'm like, yes, I went to school for Recreation, Parks, and Tourism. It was really, really fun. It was a great major. So it was a very uncommon major. I don't know. It's yes, I would say. Like that, it was just, it was a very big math engineering school. Gotcha. And I wanted to be like a sports agent. So also my, yeah, it's a whole, my background is so funny. I'm, I'm not kidding you when I tell you I did not want to go to school. Uh-huh. All I loved was volleyball. My coach picked my major for me. That's how much you were just like, I'm just here for this. Yes literally I'm just here to play so, volleyball so your coach picked it thinking that you were then going to go into like work in sports later like it was like okay we'll go ahead and like play out the athlete role as long as possible yes. and then selecting this major is going to enable you or give you better access to coaching whatever yes. recruitment Ugh, he chose it because it was the easy major and also most athletes go and do that major interesting because they typically like I think they like go into it not really knowing what they want outside of their sport. Sure. So yeah, that's what I did. Fun fact about me. I didn't play any sports growing up. So really, <laughs> you know, I did not go to a gym till I was in my twenties. Um, yeah. I old. Okay. So all of this, I've of course now working in the fitness industry. I'm constantly surrounded by the former athletes yeah. or current athletes with former careers or, yeah. you know, went to school and did it and all of the journeys that you guys go through with all of that. And like the, the identity crises that come after and just the, the, like, it's all so foreign to me, but I hear the storylines and it's interesting to like, it's just a different perspective, I guess. Yeah. Very interesting. Okay. So that's kind of where I do want to go now. Okay. So you're in school, you're performing well in sport, you're doing fine academically enough to get by ish. Um, <laughs> I mean, I made it. I did barely like literally barely. Okay. But that's because I going into my freshman year, I kind of, my coach was also obsessed with volleyball, obviously. And yep. he was obsessed with making me an all American. So my freshman year, when I got there, mm-hmm. school started. He goes, hey, do you want to get some extra reps? And, of course, I'm like a freshman. Like, yeah, of course I do. I want to get better. I'm obsessed with volleyball. He's like, okay, 5 a.m. So I go at 5 a.m. and I train with him by myself for an hour and a half-ish. Then I have class at 7. So then I go to class, go to class throughout the day. We have practice at 3, 3.30. We also have weights in between. Practice is about three hours. Maybe I have class afterwards. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day... Hey, you want to get some reps? Yeah. 9 p.m. So 9.30 to 10 or 9.30 to 11, I'm getting reps with my coach again. I did that every, almost every single day my freshman year. I got a 1.3 GPA because I was sleeping. Like I was exhausted. All I was doing was volleyball. So that was gnarly. And I really set myself up for a tough college academic career after that because then it was just like constantly having to work my way out of that hole yes and that was tough well so your coach from the jump was like there's something unique here you have something that you could take this places that maybe the average bear couldn't yeah and so I'm gonna do everything because I mean even for your coach to dedicate any time outside of the entire like much less two different times per day, early morning, late night. Like yeah. there's a lot of dedication. Do you feel like that coach, what was your relationship like with that coach? He was great. Obviously a psychopath. Like that's insane. <laughs> <laughs> um, he since passed away. So like RIP, he doesn't have to listen to this, but like absolute psychopath. Okay. Um, he would sleep in his office, was obsessed with volleyball. He so he was a workaholic, like work yes, was his life. Like okay. that's all he had was yeah. volleyball. Yeah. Um 
And I mean, his belief in me though was like insane. I remember going on my visit and he's like, I'm going to make you an all American. And I was like, I don't even know what that means, but that sounds really cool. Yeah. And he did. He literally made me an all American and into the player that I became like it was, I mean, yeah, it was wild. Did you feel undue pressure as a result of that? Or did you ever even like notice through that journey that like there's more pressure on me to perform at a high level than there is everyone else. And so now I like owe this to you to do this. Or was it always like, my gosh, thank you for the opportunity. Like where did you stand? I, he, he was such a good coach. I mean, he knew so much about volleyball and I know not all all of my teammates liked him because he was crazy. Like most coaches are crazy. Yeah. Um, and he just was obsessed with volleyball. Um, and I was so obsessed with volleyball that I think our energy just like matched. And because he believed in me so much, I started to believe in myself yeah. and I was just like excited. Like I was like, okay, yeah, let's go, let's go play volleyball. And, um, yeah, I mean, he just, it made me want to be better. He was a coach that made me want to be better. For That's sure. pretty cool. Yeah. And that is sad to think too. I don't know why he past and I don't want to dig too deep into somebody's story that they're not like voluntarily sharing. Right. Um, but there is a bit of like my heart that feels like I know that workaholism is something I have to be like, pay, pay attention to. Yes. Cause I'll turn everything into work if you let me, you know? Yes. And so, uh, like I want to have interesting conversations with friends, so I might as well record it and publish it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> which actually this is just such a beautiful like container you, that's so okay yeah and if you yeah. love it so much yeah, like that's, we're good yes we're good but I'm just saying like I'll be like hold up let me make that a job real quick uh, yeah so uh so it makes me kind of sad for them to think that maybe potentially they didn't have a whole lot but maybe they enjoyed it I don't know you know I, I don't know yes no he definitely enjoyed it yeah. I just think it was all he had like he didn't have family or anything like that and yeah. so like volleyball was his escape in his life mm -hmm. um and he was like a big volleyball player he was like a famous beach volleyball player back in like the 80s so and yeah okay so when did because you've done a good bit of beach as well that well it's fun on my recruiting trip he was like you should be playing beach volleyball and I was like no I'm from Montana like I don't know how to do this so I played indoor right my whole college career I played a little bit of beach at the end when they introduced it as a college sport and they desperately needed a team so they were like okay, everyone who played indoor has to go play beach. And it was a mess. Like our coach didn't know what he was doing. It was funny. Um, so that was my intro to beach. And I was still like, yeah, I'm not doing this. Mm -hmm. And I went, I dealt with a ton of injuries. So I missed my last year um, of volleyball and I thought I was done. And of course I'm having this identity crisis of like, I don't know who I am without volleyball. Mm -hmm. And so then when I did heal from my injury and the opportunity presented itself, I was like, yeah, I'm going to go try and play professional volleyball in Europe overseas and make a thousand dollars a month because I literally have no idea what to do outside of it. I don't know who I am without it. Yeah. And I'm not ready to find that out. So I went and played professionally in Europe for like pennies and was stressed the whole time, like trying to figure out what I was supposed to do with my life. How long did that go on? I started, so graduated in 2014. So I went, started in 2014. But we're like the same age. Yeah. Um, did you think I was older? No. Mm -mm. No, I don't know that I actually put any thought into it until just now. Oh. Like I wasn't like previously <laughs> thinking like, I wonder what our age proximity is. Like, yeah. I, no, there was zero thought. Um, I say that. I had a girl on like, Rachel, she's 24. And we were sitting there and I was like. You like don't even realize. Yeah. I forget that I'm, I don't even, 32. Yeah, I'm about to be 32. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Crazy. So graduated in 2014, went and played 2014, 2015, 2016, and then 2017 in the middle of my season, December of 2017, I'm in Germany, and that's when I was diagnosed with cancer. Okay. Yeah. And so I have seen you post a little bit about this. I wanted to, like, as far as the financial... Because that's a huge motivator with what you do today yes. is financial freedom. Yes. Because you were very imprisoned by your past financial situation. Yes. Okay. Like me, I had, I never had any of my own money. I always had to rely on someone. I was in a really toxic relationship where they basically didn't want me to work, but it was because they wanted to be able to control me. Like I could not support myself. I was stuck in this relationship. Was this when you were overseas? 
I was, I had met him actually in September of 2017. Once you came home? No, I was in Germany when okay. we met. Okay. And so we kind of started dating long distance. And then when I was diagnosed, came home and we just kind of continued dating through that experience, um, which was horrible. We can get into that if you really want to, but yeah, we will a little bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah okay so with it. Yeah. yeah, I'm an open book. Um, and I think people get stuck in relationships a lot and they don't know how to get out and it's really sad. Well, and the idea that you were someone who was in a controlling relationship is something that we should kind of talk a bit more about just because you have such a vibrant personality. And I think it can often be kind of confusing to somebody to be like, how did somebody like that get in something like that? Yes. It's like, well, cause anybody could be susceptible to like psychological warfare. Like you wouldn't believe, you know, uh, anyway, yeah, I do want to actually talk a little bit more about that, but yes. Okay. Okay. So you get diagnosed with cancer, diagnosed with cancer, December, 2017. And I'm in the, like literally in the middle of a professional volleyball season, like thought I was healthy, 26 years old. How did you no, even find out? I thought I was pregnant. Okay. I was so in the relationship and I was, because I, I mean, I literally looked pregnant. I had a tumor the size of a ball on my right ovary. Like it was humongous. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, and there were no, there was like no real symptoms. I mean, I peed my pants one time if I'm going to be totally transparent. <laughs> and I was like, I didn't know that I did it. And I was like, Kegels real quick. yeah, I was like, <laughs> that doesn't seem normal. Yeah. Um, but I was like, yeah, that's, you know, whatever. I drank a ton of water. Like I was peeing all the time because the tumor was crushing my bladder. I had no idea. So it wasn't until I like put it, cause and I was always in sweatpants. Like I'm an athlete. I'm not gonna, I'm not getting dressed up or anything. So we had our Christmas party and I put on a dress, like a tight dress. And I was like, why can't, what is happening? Why can't we suck that in? Like I couldn't suck it in, you know, when you're bloated and you're like, yeah, just suck it in. No, couldn't suck it in. It was there. And I was like, I went to my teammate and I was like, Hey, uh, and like I said, I didn't have any symptoms. So it was just kind of, okay, I think I'm pregnant. Like mm -hmm. that's the I option here. This, right. right. And so she's like, okay, let's go to the doctor. And of course I go to the doctor and they're like, oh, it's not a baby. It's a huge tumor. And I was like, what? Like total shock. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that okay. was the start of. Okay. So you're financially in a, in a bad spot. You're being an athlete, but yet again, w did you like, were you having good job satisfaction at the time or as far as like being an athlete over there, even though it was for like no pay, like, were you still just so happy to be doing what you love that you didn't care? Or was that like, this is a ticking time bomb. What's next? Was there fear looming prior to the football? Like, yeah, I, I knew that I never wanted to coach. Like, and I knew that I wasn't going to play volleyball my whole life. Um, so I think, a, I think there was a lot of fear around like, what am I doing with my life? Yeah. And I'm, I just like, I have to make money. So let's keep doing this. And I'm living, you know, like I also loved it. Like I loved volleyball. I loved living in a new country and yeah. meeting all these new people, getting to experience like different cultures. Mm -hmm. So that was so fun. Every time a season was coming to an end, it was like, crap, what's next? Mm -hmm crap what's next okay now I'm just gonna sign with a new team um so I, I would say it was like definitely a mix of both mm. well and also I guess if we think about the age that you were too then it's also like most of your peers are kind of in a position for one reason or another not necessarily the same thing as you but like that like early 20s mid 20s I don't know you know, exactly. So it's not that abnormal, even if your specific circumstances were uniquely yours. It's like, yeah, none of us know what we're doing. You yeah. know, none of us feel purposeful yet. I don't, I don't know. So no, I get that. And I, I just knew that I never wanted to work a desk job. Like I yeah. was like, I cannot be in a box. Yeah. There's no way. Yeah. So, and that also was scary. It was like, what do I do if I'm not sitting in a box? I always had this well, my dad too. My dad was like, you would be great at interviewing the NBA players. And I was like, that would be so much fun. I would love to do that. Cause like I'm tall, they're tall instead of and like you're the... a great conversationalist. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> Labradoodles. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was, yeah. It just the, the navigating, what am I good at outside mm -hmm. of volleyball? Uh -huh. Okay. So then you find out that you're sick, like real sick. And so yeah. you got to go home. Yeah, that was like party's over. I got to go. I mean, that was like a huge God thing too, was I, um, when I was diagnosed, I just was like, 
okay. I felt totally at peace and it was just like, Hey, you know, God was like, Hey, you got to go through this. You're going to be fine. This is just like, this is something you need to go through. And I was like, okay, let's do it. So that was a huge gift. And there were just a few things that happened where it was like, do you stay in Germany and get treatment or do you go back to the States and you do all that? And it was like, at the end of the day, going back to the States, getting surgery, being with my family was the best option. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I'm rushed home, have an emergency surgery where they day after Christmas, actually. So I'm diagnosed December 17th, 2017. Surgery was December 26th. Nine days later. Yes. In Billings, Montana, actually. Um, yeah. And that was just crazy. So removes the tumor the size of a football and yeah, I start chemo like a week and a half later. Yeah. Ooh. Okay. So sport for the time being is just put on pause and like it, it is interesting. Yeah. Were you always spiritual? Were you always like someone who believed in God? Cause, cause the idea that you were thinking throughout all of that, like this is just something that you need to go through. Um, obviously I know that we have connections of going to the same church and yeah. things. So I know that that's a part of your life today. Yes. And you do talk openly about it as yeah. well, which is super cool. Um, but so was that always present for you or were there years where you were like, yeah, I don't know. I like both for sure. Like yeah. I grew up in church, my family, both my mom and my dad's side of the family were Christian. So I grew up in church. Um, I think everyone kind of deals with church trauma, mm -hmm. you know, where I would like go to youth groups and I would get bullied or like people weren't nice to me or I would see things going on and I'd be like, I just feel like that's not what Christians are supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So like a lot of confusion mm -hmm. and then of course, rebelling, kind of like pulling away from Jesus and living my own life, which did not serve me at all. And I see that now. Um, but when you're in it, you're in it, you mm -hmm. know, and it's just you got to like everyone has to navigate their own journey. Mm -hmm. And I was it was so fun, like very interesting is I just wasn't happy with my life and like where I was going and leading up to my diagnosis, I felt a pull to start doing my daily devotional, which I do every single day now. Mm -hmm. But it was like, I'm just going to start small because I want to fix my relationship with Jesus. I'm going to start reading my daily devotional and I'll journal. That was it. Um, cause I always had a hard time reading the Bible. Like could not do it. Yeah. It's old text. Yeah. Like, so it's not easy to digest. It was not easy for <laughs> no. me to start there. Yeah. So if anyone's like on their journey, definitely recommend getting like a good daily devotional and just starting there. Um, What's your favorite one? So I have used Jesus Calling literally since 2017. Okay. And I just got a new daily devotional. It's so new. I can't even tell you the name. Okay. But I love Jesus Calling. It's simple. It's easy. It's short. And it was just like, it was good for me. Mm -hmm. So I started developing that and then I'm diagnosed. And that was just kind of like me being diagnosed was like, a, okay, Jesus, take the wheel. Like you're you're in control of my life. Like I'm just going to go through the motions. Like tell me what to do. Did you have any daily practices at that time? So then that's when you started the daily devotional, which I guess is where that daily practice comes in. Because yes. the reason I ask is because for me throughout my like same thing, church hurt, you name it, like grew yeah. up in a Christian church and it was just <laughs> awful Yeah. Um, for all of my own reasons, but it made it very easy for me to exit at age 17 when I was finally like moved out, not going anymore. Like, whatever. And then yeah. through my twenties, it was the Claire show. And it was just, I was so self-obsessed. Um, but I think that that's also very normal and maybe it manifested in my own unique ways, but those are pretty normal things. Like if we look at s stats, you know, like that's yeah. common and then adversity comes and you're like, I might need faith fam. Yeah. Um, you know, yes. <laughs> and so, and then you get to cultivate your own experience. And, yeah. um, so that definitely, but like also my coming into it was whenever I remember going into rooms to, to get help and they're like, you know, saying the word God. And I was like, <laughs> yeah, don't do that. You know, like I was mm. like, no, 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 no. I just need to fix this problem. Don't do that. Yeah. And thankfully I was desperate enough to take the actions that were encouraged, such as praying in the morning daily on my knees was like yeah. the first one. And I like, re I vividly remember all of those days of like getting on my knees, looking up at the popcorn ceiling where I was living and being like, 
this is so weird. Like I just see this like white dude with a beard and a robe and like, I don't know, ha- this is so weird, you know? <laughs> and like, but was desperate. So it was like, fine, I guess. Yeah. And then of course it's uh, my analogies that I love that everyone's going to be so like over it with me with this. Cause I'm not going to shut up and I just know it um, is all these little plants that are here. So like, like I'm like, you know, faith is like a little plant, right? And you plant the seed and like right now mine's a few years old. Yeah. So it's like this guy, you know, but then maybe in like a decade, it'll be like this guy. Yeah. Anyway. All right. Well, that's my analogy. No, I love it. I, uh, I'm super grateful that I don't, I never had any bitterness or resentment towards God or Jesus. It was just like, I was living my own life. Mm-hmm. And then I tell people all the time, I'm like, that girl never had a reason to get on her knees and beg God to help her. Mm -hmm. And the girl who then came to her faith was like, I'm literally on my knees begging Mm -hmm. God to save my life. Mm -hmm. And some people don't have those moments Mm -hmm. or go through those moments until later in life, or maybe they never do. Mm -hmm. And I'm super grateful that I did have that like literal come to Jesus moment Mm -hmm. where he was like, Hey, you're going to be fine. You got to go through this. And like, you're going to rely on me. And I was like, okay, Got it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It just makes me see all of those years of being agnostic for me were just like such self-reliance. And so whenever self-reliance got me into like, well, all of my ideas are trash and I feel yeah. like trash, like, yes. I guess I'm going to have to try something different. Um, then it is just so beautiful because it's like, oh, I don't have to control everything. Yep. I can give this up. Yeah. Okay. So faith is a part of your life. So you go home and you have surgery and then you start chemo. I do chemo starting beginning ish of January all the way to May. And I pretty much did it. So the way it works is you have rounds and the whole thing was just like a blur. It happened so fast. I feel like I didn't even have time to process it. Like I wasn't even in my body. I literally was just going through the motions. That's what it felt like. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was just so surreal. Like no one in my family had ever, you know, had to go through chemo or like that whole experience. And it was just crazy. Um, my brother was actually diagnosed with thyroid cancer like two months before I was diagnosed. So that was a whole thing. That was crazy. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, they're basically telling me I'm going to start chemo and you know, the odd, yeah, it's just crazy. Um, what our bodies can go through. And they basically tell me you're going to do chemo every single day for one week. And then the next week you'll do it one day that week, next day you'll do it one day that week. And then you're going to restart that whole process all over again, which is bonkers because most people do one chemo one day a week. And then they have a two weeks off. And I was just like literally six hours a day blasted. And the reason they, they were like, you're young, you're healthy. And this is a very aggressive cancer. You know, you're stage four, like we want to get rid of it. And I was just like, okay. And it was, I mean, it literally killed everything in my body. Like there were multiple, my oncologist told me, he was like, you've had a gun to your head multiple times. And I was like, this is weird bedside manner. Um, but like I had blood clots, like I was in the emergency room, I think three different times for different things, like no white blood cells in my body. Um, it was, I obviously was bald. I had no hair. Um, it was a very humbling experience and completely shifted my perspective on almost everything. Life. How old were yeah. you? 26. So you're 26 years old and you go through this. Um, when you first find out that you have cancer, you are like, okay, God, I guess I need to go through this. Did you maintain that level of faith, I guess is just the best word I can think of for it, of like throughout the experience when you're going in and out of the emergency room, blood clots, losing your hair, all these things, which like, I just, I've never been through that. So I can't pretend to understand. Yeah. I know I'm grateful that you're here. Um, but like, Same. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but did you, were you able to maintain the disposition of like, this is just something that I need to go through? So it's actually kind of wild. When I was first diagnosed, my first thought was, oh crap, I'm going to lose my hair, which is so sad. It's like, that's the first thought, but it's because we live in a society where it's like physical beauty is so important. And mm-hmm. I was like, I had this long, like beautiful blonde curly hair, 
Like I was like, wait, I'm going to be bald. What is my head going to look like? And it, that was the switch. Like I had to make a switch within like a minute to be like, wait a second, you're going to be bald because you're fighting for your life. Like let's mm -hmm. flip the perspective. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was a huge lesson in itself. And then of course I had moments like I'll never forget one time I'm sitting in the Walmart parking lot. I've got a mat. I'm bald. So I'm wearing, it's the middle of winter in Montana. I'm wearing a beanie and yeah, it's cold. It's cold. I've got plastic gloves on and I've got a mask on because I have no white blood cells in my body and I'm going to have to go into Walmart and like get my groceries, well, you did know, you lose weight at this time too. Like, I mean, I don't like if you're, I just can imagine your body probably didn't feel like home. Like no. here you were in this empowered body for your whole lifetime doing yes. sport at the highest level. Yeah. And then suddenly now you're totally not in control of anything that's going on. Yeah. No immune system to speak of. Like, I just cannot imagine the like sudden jarring experience that that was. No, I, I mean, this is a, yeah. So you talk about mindset and, you know, maintaining that uh -huh. I was so determined not to let cancer dictate how I was going to live my life mm -hmm. and who I was going to be that I showed up every single day. Like I would bring brownies to the oncology center before cancer and I would bring people brownies. I was like, because this is like, this brings me joy. Like laughter brings me joy and being funny. Like, yeah, I would make self deprecating jokes, yeah. bald jokes. Yeah. And I would make like funny, like jokes out of the experience. Right. Yeah. Um, and I literally was like, every single day I would go to chemo. I'd make the jokes with the nurses. They'd give me my chemo. I would fall asleep for six hours. My mom would come pick me up. We would go walk three miles. And then I would go to the gym every single day after chemo because it was so important to me. I was like, this is my happy place. I've been an athlete my whole life. I'm not willing to give this up. Even though they told me like, don't, you don't have any white blood cells. I still, I went because I was like, this is literally going to keep me going mm -hmm. and if I give up these things that are super important to me like I will not survive so that was huge for me and yeah I'll never forget I'm sitting in the Walmart parking lot about to go grocery shopping and I'm on Instagram and all my friends they're like young they're on spring break they're like doing this and I just remember like screaming in the car and I was like you know what you get five minutes and you get to be pissed off and upset you get to have a pity party you get to be the victim for five minutes and then you're gonna get your shit together essentially because I, and people are like, you know, you got to feel it to heal it. And I'm like, yeah, when you're in that situation, if you let yourself go down into the hole and stay there, you're not going to come out. Mm -hmm. It's going to be harder and harder every single time you do it to come out. So like five minute timer and I would let myself be pissed and then I would move on and yeah. I would go back to being myself essentially. Yeah. Well, and this is like what, eight years ago now. And so ish seven, eight, I think six, I think May is six. Am I doing okay. the math right? Um, probably. I probably I did finished it wrong. chemo in May of 2018. Okay. Yep. And, and that's 2024. We're really good at this guys. Um, so, but either way, I mean, at that time, I mean, I guess maybe conversations around health and mental health were taking place to some degree and like they're, they're, you know, how much they go together, but I don't know that the narrative was like, barking at you. So it's just interesting to me that you had the disposition at that time, even whenever maybe the practitioners that you were working with were potentially telling you like, don't do that. Just stay home and in a bubble. Yeah. And you were like, I won't survive. D like, uh, were there any mentors in your life helping you have this disposition of positivity, um, continue it? Like all of these, the way that you were showing up in this whole experience, was just abnormal and probably really contributed to your quality of life throughout it exactly. and potentially helped you get through it. I don't, you know, I'm not going to, I disclaimer, I'm obviously not a doctor. Um, <laughs> anyway. Same. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I got a lot of alphabet soup certifications in fitness. That's all about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have anyway, any of those. Um, yeah. But she does have a degree in parks and rec or whatever the heck. <laughs> yeah. Sport management. <laughs> so like smart girlies, um, YouTube university is a hell of a thing, yes. which by the way, did you see Jordan Peterson's exodus thing? No, we can talk about that later. <laughs> anyway, I'm like <laughs> shooketh that this is on the internet. Um, and I'm excited about it, but okay. So, um, was there anything like, where'd this I, come from? My, my, so I had huge ambitions to 
continue to play for professional volleyball. I was like, cancer's not keeping me down. I'm going to have a comeback season. So that mindset was like, you got to be preparing during this. So when you're done, you can go play. And I literally was not done with chemo in April. And I was messaging my agent to be like, Hey, do you have a team for me yet? And he was like, aren't you doing chemo? And I was like, well, I might be done soon. And he was like, Jen, why don't you just like go get better? And I was like, just find me a team. Like I was like, that was my mindset. Wow. Yeah. So this makes me think that maybe this is, do you feel if you weren't able to look back, could this, a lot of this mindset that you had, do you feel like a lot of that was cultivated through all of your years of involvement in sport? Definitely. I also had, I mean, my, my family was very supportive. Like I, dude, I, I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but I know it was a God thing. Like that's my only explanation because my little sister, like we were talking about it one day and I was like, were you ever scared? And she was like, no, I literally did not think you were going to die at any point. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. But like, I had all of these, like I would go to get chemo and my nurses would sit, they sat me down one day and they were like, so how are you? And I was like, I'm great. I uh, feel like I'm shitting glass because that's a whole nother chemo side effect, but I'm good. Other than that, it really hurts to poop. Um, Like I would make jokes. Right. And they were like, Jen, seriously, be honest. Yeah. They were like, be honest. How are you? And I, I remember it being like, no, I'm like actually really good. Like it, it could be, my mindset was it could be so much worse. And it's, I'm sitting there getting chemo and I'm looking around at all these other people getting chemo. And there was a girl in there who's 30 years old had her entire colon taken out, had to poop in a bag for the rest of her life. And I was like, it could be so much worse, Mm -hmm. like so much worse. Well, and I also love that, you know, you're like, I wish I had a better answer for you. And I understand because we (laughs) want to be able to verbalize. And then at the end of the day, like what better answer than like, oh, God took care of it. No, literally he did. I cannot, I cannot explain the strength and the mindset and the courage that I had. It's, it is, it has to be a God thing. It's so, yeah, it's so ridiculous. Like no one is, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, I was on so much medication. I had to give myself three shots a day in the stomach for blood thinners and immune cell boosters, like white blood cell boosters. And on top of that, I'm taking other medication, like just crazy Mm -hmm. stuff that doesn't make sense other than God. Okay. (laughs) Also, you're in a relationship that you're not stoked about. Yeah. Well, I didn't know that he was a horrible human at the time. Like he was putting on this great persona of like, I'm supporting my girlfriend through cancer. And I remember being on the phone with him and being like, hey, like you, you don't have to do this. Like this early relationship, like I'm just, this is your, this is your time to get out. But like, if you're going to leave me in the middle of it, like if you know that that, if if you can't do this, I'm not mad at you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he was like all gung ho about it. And he was like, you know, and my friends were telling, like asking me, you know, how do you deal with this? You're such a good guy. And as soon as he said that, I should have been like, what, what a weird thing. What a weird thing to say. You want a gold star. And at the end of our relationship, when I found out he was cheating on me, he told me verbatim, I will never forget this. It's the craziest thing. Jen, I cheated on you because you were bald and it made me question my sexuality and it was really hard for me. That was the, and like, I just laughed. Like I was like, wow, that's the craziest thing that I've ever heard. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, people, I mean, that's like, it was emotionally abusive. It was yeah, all the things, right? When did you start to identify that that was emotionally abusive? Um, when I would take a nap after getting chemo and wake up to several text messages and phone calls from him saying that I was cheating on him while I'm literally in my parents' chair in the living room, bald. Did sleeping. you try to defend him and hide it from the world? I, um, not, I didn't really talk about it, but not, not, at, not at that point. I think we dated for... I want to say two years. Um, but I don't, I, yeah, no, I don't think I talk. I definitely didn't talk to my family about it mm-hmm. like as much mm-hmm. um, until the end when I was like 
I got to get out of here, but I can't because it's so manipulative and I can't support myself. Like I'm stuck. And then God literally removed him from my physical presence to where I was like, okay, we're done. And I was able to separate. The last one though was a doozy. <laughs> that one was way worse. Well, oh gosh. <laughs> I, I just, uh, I did get myself in a situation once too, where I dated somebody and kept it all behind closed doors and tell anybody the truth. And, uh, it was very manipulative and, and, um, it was shocking to me. And I remember trying to leave the relationship repeatedly and being begged and pleaded with. And just, I mean, you know, if that occurs for hours upon hours upon hours, you just get so depleted that you're just willing to do anything to get out of the situation. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, I just, uh, I have a lot of compassion for it because it, yeah. it, you just never, it affects far more people than we probably think that it does. And it's um, really dangerous when you no longer trust your own thoughts, yeah. you know, or your own actions. And you just think that everything that you do is wrong. It's, that's not a good spot. And I don't, and then I just think about like, yet again, just like all things um, that have been really, really transformed suddenly. It's so often for me telling somebody the truth. When I can yeah. finally admit like, hey, uh, yeah, I think this is a problem, you know, then yes. I can actually get some help. Yeah. I, yeah, I was in, my last relationship was horrible and like it was so bad to the point where I was researching narcissism and emotional abuse, manipulation, like, because I knew something, I knew it wasn't me and I knew something was wrong, but I did not know how to get out of it. Like it was such a mental, like it was a mind f right like it was just so it was crazy and i knew it was crazy and i didn't tell anyone about it mm -hmm. for months and because it was like the shame the guilt and also the like manipulative like trying to protect them mm -hmm. and yeah i remember one time i had like told my family about him cheating on me and i he he knew that i did that and he lost it on me he was mm -hmm. like how dare you tell them you've completely ruined our relationship and I was like wait this is crazy and yeah it's sad because I I think I did try I I talked to friends about it and everyone was like you need to leave him you know kind of like judgy telling you what to do like not really listening and trying to help but it was more of the like you need to leave why are you in that that's such like you you should know better like all these things making me feel more guilty and more shame. And then of course, like, I'm like, okay, well, I'm just not going to talk to anyone about it. Yeah. It, if you were to speak to like, how do you wish that you would have been supported at that stage of things? I, uh, it's so hard because in my head, I'm like, I knew that I needed to get out. Yeah. I just needed time to figure out how and I think that's what people don't have compassion for is like, well, if you're it's so abusive, why are you in it? And it's like, you guys, I know that I need to leave. Why are you making me feel bad about leaving? Like I need a second because it's so manipulative and I can't, it's like, it's so hard to explain yeah. the like psychological warfare that's actually going on. Mm -hmm. And I, I just knew I was like, I prayed every night and I was like, God, I know I'm going to get out of this exactly when I'm supposed to. And I actually learned a lot of lessons from that relationship about why I was attracting people like this in the first place. Like, why am I choosing these people? Can you talk about that? I like, what did you learn? Why were you attracting people? I'm going like to get real. I'm going to get real deep because this was the heat. This was the big, this was the big, uh, realization. I love my dad. He passed away in 2019. He was my best friend, favorite person in the world, best dad in the world. Like, I'll die on that hill. Okay. He was so supportive of volleyball, of my life, all the things. Yeah. And wasn't a great husband. Like, for example, my mom had, or my dad had a whole nother family on the side. Right. Um, and so, you know, cheating, all the things. Uh -huh. Didn't treat my mom well. And I remember growing up I never had a boyfriend it was always my my siblings had the significant others and I would always be like well I don't need anyone I have my dad I'm not going to date anyone until I find someone that's like my dad and I always made that joke right and then I started to choose people and I remember as a kid you know I asked my dad I'm like why weren't we enough right so of course those things the like 
not being enough, the having to prove myself, that the having to like work for love. Um, and then of course, choosing someone who is literally a narcissist and is manipulative and making me feel like, oh, I need to work harder for you to love me mm -hmm. or I need to prove to you that I'm enough. Like I have something to prove. Mm -hmm. And I had the realization that, you know, my dad, amazing dad, as amazing as he was, I'm not attracting men that are my dad as my dad. Obviously I'm attracting men that were my dad as a husband who mm -hmm. was narcissist and cheater and didn't treat my mom well, you know? And obviously as he got older, he had a great relationship with my stepmom. So it's like, we all, you know, have those journeys and those lessons. And I know that he has a lot of regret around that. And yeah. sorry to, I know you're not here to defend yourself, yes. but <laughs> this well. is just my own perspective, but that was the realization of like, wait, you literally don't have to work for someone's love yeah. or prove anything to anyone ever. Yeah. Well, and, and for me, I have got to experience what the opposite of that even feels like in order to know that it's accessible, you yeah. know? And so it has, I've, I've talked about this before, but it's been so confusing to date someone who like knows more about my past than anyone yeah. and like hears it and then just has love and I'm like I'm really conf you're supposed to you do like you're not even supposed to be able to ask me these questions much less hold space for them yeah like what is this and so I've I mean I couldn't like I couldn't have told you that that was an option because I hadn't experienced it before anyway. Yes. It's so then it's really cool because now I know that it is, you know, and, and we're all in the thick of it. And I say all the time, we're delusional creatures. And I know that there are shit that I don't even like, there's stuff going on. And I don't even know about, about myself right now. You know, yes. Uh, yes. we're all in the thick of it, but, um, that I, I guess I just appreciate you. Like, the powerful part to me is that like, if I attract partners that are unhealthy in some way, there's still some healing work for me to do. Yeah. And you show up in my life as my teacher, if you let me, or if I let you, you yes. know? And so like yes. with those exes, like you've been able to take away lessons from those things and find ways in which you showed up and that you're not proud of. And that, you know, I mean like, I, I don't know. I just, I think about all those situations for me personally. I'm like, those are so constructive for yes. me. And like, as much as, um, like there was just, a, there was a lot of gnarly work that needed to take place before I was going to have sufficient trust in my own intuition, yep. faith in God, yes. actually relying upon, you know, like there's just, there was a lot that needed to happen yeah. because it was like, I don't like, I, I can't even trust me. So like, yeah, no checks that you can't, you know? Yeah. Um, no. Even though anyway, well, like the choose, like I see the red flags, but I'm yet, I'm still choosing it. Like that was the big thing for me. And then, yeah, literally when I met my now boyfriend, he is, an absolute angel, like literally a gift from God because I did all this healing and he's so nice to me. And I remember at the beginning of the relationship being like, when's the shoot? Like, when's mm -hmm. the truth going to come out? Mm -hmm. Like, you're not actually this good of a person, right? Like you're, you're going to use my wound, my wounds as weapons later. Right. Like that's what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And literally like, it was weird for me. And it was hard to be like, wait, I don't have to like earn my, earn your love. Like you just literally love me. It was crazy. And now I'm just like, so cheesy. Yeah. Like, I'm like, <laughs> like, I love it. I'm like, I am so like, I would go through all of that again, just because I know that this man is on the other side. Yeah. Like, That's and cool. we, and I'm, I mean, we've talked about this, like we had to go through those moments in relationships mm -hmm in order to become the people that we are. Totally. And I think that's the thing too, is I'm just not in a mood to ever put the blame on anybody else ever, because ever. I can always find the ways in which I showed up. Yes. Therefore it is not your fault. I got into this, you yeah. know? And, um, I, I don't know. I just, I look back at all of those and it's like, for example, for me today and my current relationship, I know that I have a tendency to be passive aggressive and defensive whenever things like if yeah. you call something out, like I'm going to defend my position immediately and then eventually I'm going to be passive aggressive. So watch out. 
you know, and these are behaviors that I like learned early. And so today I have to do the very best that I can to stop Mm -hmm. whenever I recognize and behaving in that way, ask for distance from the whatever thing that triggered the thing and go, this has nothing to do with you. I need to deal with yes. this. And then thankfully these days I take it to God in prayer and that seems to work a lot better. And yeah. it's all one day at a time, but like, it's just the point of all of that, I suppose, is that I didn't use those same tools in past situations. So therefore when I would like, it was always your fault, you know, it's just like all of those behaviors were taking place and I wasn't using those tools. So like, I'm just going to keep being defensive and passive aggressive. And like, we're at odds. We're not at the same team. So how was this going to be healthy anyway? Because look at how I was showing up, Yeah, you know? And so I feel so much of what you're saying as far as like tremendous gratitude for who's in front of me today, because I'm like, this is such a valuable person. I'm so grateful. I'm in a place today to understand that better than I was historically, you know? And like, I truly believe that he's just an alien and like as cool as it gets. But anyway, (laughs) I'm like, you Uh, can't be real. I'm like, you're not a human. (laughs) You're, you can't convince me otherwise. That's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool though. No, it's the best. Um, yeah, I my peop, my tendency was people pleasing and I was always the problem. And so that I think gets people typically when you date a narcissist it's because you're you're trying to like earn earn something or like prove your worth. Yep. And um Can you give a real time if you don't mind um example of that because what would that be like? So an example of a situation in which you realize that you are pulling your people pleaser behavior and you've got to try to, because like, because do you notice today for me, I noticed today that in real time, something will happen. And I'm like, I want to revert back to the past behavior of the people pleaser of, you know, like, so say I do the whole, uh, passive aggressive defensive thing. And then I almost want to overcorrect to, okay, I'll do this people pleaser thing when that's actually probably not productive either. Uh, yeah. and instead yet again, need that pause, need a minute, got to regulate yourself, got to like get some outside perspective, take some different action. Um, as opposed to let me overcorrect as hard as possible and earn it again via completely compromising anything that I thought was okay. Yeah. No, I, I mean, it happens. I mean, my relationship is, I mean, he's literally a gift. Yeah. Like it's the healthiest relationship, friendship, anything that I've ever been in Mm -hmm. where like something will come up and I feel like it's a safe enough space for me to be able to be like, Hey, this bothers me. I know that this is probably something that's coming up from my own past and being cheated on and feeling maybe a little insecure about this. So I want to like first acknowledge that, but also like this thing that you did kind of bothered me. Um, you know, I'm like, I can do that. So There's, do you feel like then it's just choosing to have hard conversations on repeat, whether you like, yes. I'm just going to do the communication thing. Cause I think that's the thing is like, you hear from all of these people that like relationship is literally the hardest thing that we do and not even necessarily romantically, but to successfully navigate relationship means you're going to have to work your ass off for it. Yeah. But it's also the most profound experience that we know I feel. Yes. So like, okay, fine. Then I guess I'm going to have to work my tail off at this. Yes. Well, they say romantic relationships are like, will bring up the most triggers yeah which is why it's so much easier not to be in them right right because like I don't want to feel this way I don't want to feel like insecure or whatever feeling is coming up because I'm in a relationship and I care about you like that's gross I don't want to do that and it's also the most healing experience and I think just like being able to understand your partner and having a partner that understands you and doesn't judge you Mm -hmm. or like look at you differently because you're like hey I'm feeling a little insecure about this and they're like thank you for sharing that. I love you. I don't want you to feel that way. Like, let's talk about solutions. Like it's literally the most (laughs) incredible. Like he is, he is such a gift. Would you say that you, are you, uh, so you're not avoidant were you ever avoidant? Absolutely. Are you kidding me? Here was another, (laughs) this is another big one. You guys, I would choose partners who lived long distance because I had a long distance relationship with my father. And that was normal to me. And that's what I felt comfortable with. If you were near me too much, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, I need my space. This is crazy. Like, absolutely not. Every single person that I dated was long distance. 
I have so many, like my brain's <laughs> just going all over the place. It's I crazy. I do want to progress this, but I definitely just have, like, have so many more thoughts. I think we'll just talk more about, uh, we'll just cap this here. This has been a good segment and we'll keep going. <laughs> I'm not done with anyway, you. Anyway, we're relationship coaches. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're actually not. We're just <laughs> girlies in our lower 30s that are working our tails off. And I really do think that like yes. what I know to be true, at least so far, and this is, you know, what is it's May now. Yes. And I, you know, met Jimmy last fall. And so not even a full year, but get, you know, it's we're rapidly, which is like so cool that this has been the most wild experience to be like, I just feel peaceful about this. Like yes. you and, and how, what are some things that like, when I think about, okay, so what are attractive things? The paramount thing when I was attracted to his brain from the jump, but then from yeah. there, it's the consistency. Like, yeah, yes. like, like this is the same person day in, day out. Like I don't have to worry yeah. about what you're up to because you're just you. And yes, your schedule varies greatly and you do a lot of things, which is so fun. Stay busy, do your thing, yeah. you know, but like I'm not worried about things. So I just get to feel peace around it because that's the same person showing up every single day. Yes. So if there's any standout to me of like what seems and feels different, one, it's the God reliance thing has been a game changer for yep. me. And then also just like leaning into like, Hey, consistency is actually like really good for your soul. You should probably just like a- appreciate that. hundred percent. I also, I just think self-awareness is huge in a relationship too. Yeah. Like being able to be like, Ooh, why do I feel like I need to earn your love? Why do I feel like I need to explain myself to you when I clearly don't, you know, but like, yeah, I think consistency has been a huge like crazy Mm -hmm. like you're the same person Mm -hmm. every day Mm -hmm. and uh creates so much peace it's so I've never felt more safe in a relationship in my entire life like yeah it's incredible okay I'm excited okay so (laughs) I was gonna ask about God but we've talked about that a lot so yeah um what I do want to go to now is mm, okay I want to ask real quick about the water situation because it is something that you're so freaking passionate about. Like, it's not just like your job. It's like, (laughs) you really like it. No, I'm obsessed. Right. I literally took volleyball obsession and channeled it, channeled water word, (laughs) channeled it to water. (laughs) Proof. Nerd. (laughs) I literally, you cannot say anything about water around me. I will be like, oh, really? Okay. So what happened with, because I will say I do have experience with the Kangen water and, um, but, and I really enjoy it, but I want to hear your perspective because I will say that's one of the things for me that I've allowed finances to be a barrier for. Like I've known for before I met you that I want a Kangen machine. Yeah. So that's what you do. And that's something that I want, but it's not a cheap machine. So I, I even have questions. It's great. Cause this is just going to turn into like a real quick little sales pitch for you, <laughs> but I have actual questions that yeah. you inevitably have answers to about it. Um, so what attracted you to it and what did it do for you? I, um, before I was diagnosed, pro athlete, healthy, right? My friend had actually introduced it to me and he was like, just drink this water. He, it was like a very subtle, like, Hey, drink this gallon of water. And I was like, okay, I love water. All I drink is water. I drink out of a water hose. Like I'm good. So I started drinking the gallon and within one gallon, I'm, I started detoxing and I was like, I mean, it was like clearing me out, right. To save people the like gory details. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had like, I had like stuff coming out of my eyes where I was like detoxing and I woke in less like less than 24 hours. And I woke up the next day and I was like, what is this water? And he's like, Oh, it's just, it's like medical grade water. Right. And I was like, no, I don't know what, like, it's literally no, like this is poop water. This is for old sick people. I don't need it. I'm a healthy pro athlete. And then God quickly humbled me. And a year and a half later, I'm diagnosed with cancer. And at this point, like I had forgotten all about it. It was never on my radar or anything. And when I went through chemo, after chemo, I, you know, I have all of these side effects, like neuropathy so bad. I can't walk. Like I have to watch my feet take steps because I don't know they're there. And I'm, when I lay down to sleep, it feels like a thousand needles are stabbing me in the bottom of my feet. I have brain fog so bad. I don't know how to like spell my ABCs, like simple words. Couldn't write them. Couldn't write letters. I had blood clots. I had no white blood cells, migraines, vertigo, fatigue, like you name the side effect. And I was struggling with it. And there was no way I was going to be able to function as a regular human, let alone play professional volleyball again. And I remember I go to my doctor and I'm like, Hey, all of these things are happening. Can you help me? And he's like, no, we can't help you, but we can put you on meds for the rest of your life. And I just knew that that was not the option. Like pre-cancer, 
I wouldn't even take uh, ibuprofen for a headache. Like I was like, let's just drink water. Like, what drink contributed water. to that? Why did you choose not to do that? I just didn't, I didn't want to take medicine. I didn't like taking medication. I thought that unless it was like absolutely needed, like I had pneumonia one time in college and I took medication. Mm -hmm. I just didn't feel good taking it. Like I was like, I want my body to be able to like do the thing it's supposed to do. So if I have a headache, maybe I'm dehydrated. Something's going on. I'm going to quickly tangent off and just, you know, uh, I had hives. In fact, I think I've, uh, they're almost entirely gone, but I had like hives that were really bad for a few months this year for the first time in my life. And I was so bad for a few months and this is, I've never dealt with allergies. This is like a new experience to me. Um, and even just being put on antihistamines, like I finally, it, they just progressed and they got so bad and I was so miserable at night. Itchy. Have you ever had hives? Uh, yes. When I have an anaphylactic reaction. Okay. So they were just so, they were raised Horrible. up like, oh my gosh. Oh my. And so I became like a spotted animal. Like literally I remember like the day I finally went to the dermatologist was the day that there were 54 of them on me that morning when I woke up and like, this was just every day they were all over me anyway. So the dermatologist just tells me like, oh, it's steroid antihistamine, right? Typical. There you go. Yeah. And I'm furious, but I'm miserable. Yeah. And so I was like, so I still refuse the steroid because I'm a brat and I hate medicine. Um, but anyway, I Obviously. did do the antihistamines <laughs> to like get some uh, relief because it was so, the itching and so on was so bad. Yeah. And um, even just being on antihistamines for like two, three weeks, like I was experiencing brain fog. And this is something simple that like yes. a lot of people are on and have been on for so many years. And I'm not speaking to everyone else's experience yet again. I'm just telling my perspective with this, but like I was pissed yeah. because I'm like, I don't want to rely on this every single day. Also, there are actual other side effects. This is not major side effects. This is whatever, but like, I'm not enjoying this. This right. is making me feel like a space cadet. Also, if you're having to take it for the rest of your life, like there's no way. I'm not supposed to take medicine for the rest of my life, right? Like that's crazy. It it was, and and I just know, so, and so I now have a whole different perspective for it because, of course, this has caused me to have a lot of conversations around it. And the number of my friends that have been on antihistamines for so many years, among other things, and it's just their, it is just their norm, and it's been their norm, and I, I can't. I'm not going to have more than my perspective to offer, but it makes yeah. me have a ton of compassion for it, and just like. I hated it personally. Yes. And so then I did seek a different allergist who like does this weird chiropractic thing that he even is like, this is woo woo. Can't explain, but like it does work non-invasive. Here you go. <laughs> um, and they're like, I'm doing so much, but I still get one or two right now, Yeah. but like it's worlds different. And I stopped taking the antihistamines and it immediately calmed it down. And it is something, it is literally just a device that figures out what I'm reacting to. Yeah. And then calms my nervous system via him just running this quick little thing down my back That's right so cool yeah it's crazy it was like born in australia a number of years ago if you're in the austin area and you want access to that just uh send me a dm and i'll happily like send you i mean i like i can't that's so whatever cool. it helped me that's all i know i want access to that yeah i'll tell you i'll tell you okay. um yeah and so anyway um medicine you hated it medicine mm -hmm. so i just yeah i didn't think that was a realistic option i was mm -hmm. like i'm 26 years old and you're gonna have me on meds for the rest of my life that's absolutely insane mm -hmm. and you're telling me we can't really help you but we can put you on like maybe it'll work bonkers um so i said no and didn't my mom wanted to fill the prescription that the doctor had wrote he was like just in case and i was like yeah i'm not doing it i don't even want the option like that's not happening mm -hmm. and that's when like my friend had posted something on facebook about it. And I like, mind you had just been on my deathbed for six months. The odds of my cancer coming back were like 76%. And the odds of survival just from my chemotherapy at five years was 50%. So it was just like, maybe I'm going to live, maybe I'm not. So I like, I needed an option. I needed a better option. Mm -hmm. And when he posted the thing about water, I was like, I didn't know anything about it. I didn't do any of my own research. I had gone to college with this person. He played basketball and I, it was a total faith buy, like was insane. Well, you were at a perfect moment of opportunity of willingness to do things. Yes. You know, like I was, it, he caught you at the right time of like, yeah. I don't know. I'll try anything. Literally. I was like, I was on my knees begging God to help me. Mm -hmm. And 
yeah, I, I pretty much just bought a machine and of course I had no money. Like it was like, I had no money. I had no job. I had no money coming in, but I was like, I want to live. So like, I'll figure out the money later. Like I was that desperate. And so I bought a machine and literally within a week, this is not a medical claim either. Like this is just my own personal experience, testimony, whatever. I start drinking the water and literally within a week of drinking the water, almost all my side effects had gone. And that's when I started doing research and I was like, oh, because true hydration actually is able to get into my cells and start like literally detoxing my body and having my body kind of push the medicine medicine out. And now it's functioning how it's supposed to function. Mm. Like it was, it was insane. And I tried to go to my doctor and I'm like, dude, this is crazy. Like you told me I was going to be on meds for the rest of my life. And he was like, absolutely not. I don't want to hear it. Mm -hmm. And that was the moment that I was like, how many people are diagnosed with cancer? How many people go through chemo? How many people die just from the chemo? Like I have to, I have to research this. I have to share this. Like, this is crazy. Yeah. And I became obsessed. Yeah. Just because I, strictly because I wanted to know why it was doing to my body what it was doing. And so that was in 2018. It was in 2018, July of 2018. So I finished chemo in May, had all these things. July of 2018, I got my machine. I was off all of my medication by October, 2018. And I started playing professional volleyball again, December, 2018. I think there's few, a few contributing factors um, to For this, sure. but I'm just stoked about this. Cause like, <laughs> girl, what a comeback, you know, no, it was, like that. And, yeah. and like the experience that you had was like literal hell in there, like yeah. between relationship stuff going on and your own physical body being this completely foreign experience than anything you've ever known before. Yes. I can only, I mean, I just, I can't, I've never been through it. Um, and I'm so grateful for that. Uh, so, okay. So then real quick, because my then follow-ups are, okay, I'm familiar. Like it's a machine and it filters your water. I know that. And it's like, definitely, I, I do know a number of people who like swear by it and, um, they're really into it. That's what I know. (laughs) And, uh, So as far as like, I know that water is something, if there's like certain areas of my life, I'm like eager to optimize being a health professional, um, water's on the (laughs) roster. And then as you can see, I have that thing over there that filters water. That's like super cheap because, um, your girl and money were a work in progress. Okay. Uh, so we all got to start somewhere. Yeah. And I restarted in a new career, uh, and thought that it was going to go far better financially than it did. And I'm just eating humble pie for a while and that's okay. I don't even regret it, but, um, it's been a journey. So then my curiosity I want to ask then is, okay, so the water has had profound positive impacts for you. You now, um, obviously sell the machines you, it is, I am correct. And it's a multi-level marketing structure of a business, right? Technically no. Okay. It's direct sales. So it kind of works like real estate. So people, the reason it's not multi-level marketing is there's a few reasons. Like you don't have to do, there's no monthly quotas. There's no monthly like restocking. It's like you literally buy a machine one time and that's that. Okay. And the other thing is with the company, like technically I could make more money than the person above me. Like there's a, there, they have like a patented commission structure. It's all, like okay. Can, it's a little like aggressive to go into, okay. but it's a patented commi- commission structure okay. to where there's only eight pieces to the pie. Okay. Once the eight pieces are out, like divvied out, there's no more to give out. So people, for example, if I'm getting all eight pieces of my pie, the person above me is not getting a single piece of my commission. Okay. So that's mostly why it's not an MLM, but it's like real estate where you basically are sell. It's like over and down. Okay. So I'm different lanes, different franchises, like a brokerage. Like if I'm a broker and I bring, bring an agent on to sell a house, like if they sell a house, they're making commission. I'm also making a little bit of commission because I'm the broker. Yeah. I was an agent for six and a half years. So I'm familiar. Oh my gosh. Uh, Okay. So, so essentially it's that, (laughs) but you're selling (laughs) yourself. I imagine you were good at real estate. I was great. Yeah. Yeah. I loved it. It was fun. Yeah. Um, okay. So if I want to go buy a machine right now and I heard it's expensive, so I'm scared. I'm my real avatar. I'm me. 
you oh. know? Then like, like what, is this a hypothetical? What do you say? This feels real. Yeah, yeah, no, this is very real. Like I'm literally your, I am your avatar right now. So like, what would you even say? Just because I, I have had interest. Like that's this has nothing to do with why I have you here today. But conveniently, it's something I have curiosity about, and it's on mm-hmm. the like, hey, when you like can afford to, I don't know, get your nails done again or something, then like maybe I'll take a look at this. Yeah. Because of the upfront expense, based on my understanding. Yeah. So what would you say to me? I have a lot of compassion for people who are like, it's expensive. I don't want to pay for it. And I'm like, I get it. Yeah. I literally laughed at it. I was like, no, that's for old sick people. I don't need it. Yeah. I made my decision when I was literally on my deathbed. And most people, unfortunately, are going to have to be on their deathbed to make some decision. sort of health issue to prioritize their health in that way. Yeah. Like I was, I was so full of ego that I was like, no, that's like not a real thing until it needed to become a real thing. So I'm like, you know what? I get it. Mm-hmm. There are different ways for you to pay. Like you could do for me. I, like I said, I had no money coming in. Mm-hmm. I had no job, like no income. Mm-hmm. I had to do a finance option. And there are finance options where you can do, you can pay through the company. Or if you have a good credit score, like open a freaking credit card. Like don't pay interest for 21 months, put the machine on the card and then pay the machine off when you can. Mm-hmm. Cause then it's like, after you pay it off, you literally don't have to pay for it. Mm-hmm. Like you replace the filter once a year. That's freaking awesome. And it does 65 different things. Yeah. Like crazy. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's either a priority for people or it's not. Like it's either a must have now or they don't care to invest yet. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, so it's like everyone's on their own journey. I'm not going to like shove it down people's throats and be no. like, you have to do it. If you don't get it, like. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I, I love your disposition about it because like, I think if you have enough faith in what you're up to yes. and like, like, I don't think you'd be doing it if you thought you were like being a snake oil salesman. Like, I just don't believe no. that about you. Yeah. Therefore, like, I believe that you think it works. And then even the way that you're speaking of it now is like, you're not trying to convince me of anything because you probably just believe enough that like this thing worked for me. It's worked for enough other people. If you actually want that, that's great. Like, I think it's a great idea. And then like, that's, I mean, it makes me think of with my own coaching business. Like I'm like, yeah, so it's a stellar resource. And if you want to use it, that's great. And I get encouraged all the time by like the, the team that works with me on, um, the back end of the app. And they're like, you know, like you could do these four month structures of signups up front and I would get more buy-in. And I even understand from a business perspective, this is probably smarter to do. Like you could, I could easily talk to a business coach who would be like, Claire, you're doing it all wrong. This is probably why I'm still broke. Um, because I have a great product and I don't know how to actually market it. Um, but here's the thing. I'm like, if you want to be here, great. If you don't, great. So I like only do yeah. month to month everything because like with the subscription, like I'm like, if you're loving this resource, stay here. If you're not, peace. You yeah. Know? Because but, like, I have so much faith in the product. Yeah. Whatever. There's so much conviction. Also, you don't want to work with people who don't want to be there. Like no, I don't want to be talking idea, to like, people. Holding you hostage. Like we'll, I literally no. feel like I don't have to convince anyone. Yeah. And if I'm feel like if I feel like I have to convince you, you're not my person. I don't yeah. need to have this conversation with you because yeah. I'm not going to try and convince you. And yet again, for your own peace, from the perspective yes. of like, as soon as I think that I know what's best for you, yeah. Um, now I have a problem. Hundred percent. So I'm gonna have to let go of that. Yeah. Which is really hard as someone who likes to be a fixer with tools all the time. And you're like, oh, but it would help you so much. Mm-hmm. I yeah. Mm-hmm. There's. I'm not gonna do that though Release because there that. are so many people out there who desperately need this. Yeah. Who believe in it? Who are searching for it? Like just like I was. Yeah. And that's like. I mean, you have so many haters online. Like so many people. It's not real. And I'm like, if I would have kept going thinking that oh this is fake this isn't real it's not going to help me I have no idea where I would be Mm -hmm. and that's like when I do feel like people are louder with the negativity I'm like how selfish of me to not share it Mm -hmm. after what it did for me right that's and that's like I always go back to that yeah um okay I love that I do want to round out here with uh I want to ask you because you like I said you're like a content queen Cute. You know? Um, and so because of the authenticity that we talked about up front, like I want to know what your structure, because you do like promote your business through your social media, but then you also just share your life there yeah, and you share your faith there mm-hmm. and you choose to show up there. You're the yeah. content creator that everybody wishes they would be like. I mean, even seriously, like I'm flattered. I, like I, it's, it's so funny because my own journey with creation has been such a ride of like, yeah, that's a whole other podcast. Figuring it out. 
Yeah. And like, what even, you know, I, this is, this one's funny. I haven't shared this publicly, but, um, you know, Jimmy's birthday was like a couple weeks ago and I'm loving reality so much that I was like, didn't give a shit to post about it that day. Yeah. I did do it because I want him to feel the appreciation. And I know that that is a method in which he will feel that. Yeah. And he runs his business. And like, I want to do that, you know, but it was, I was like talking to him about it. I'm like, I just love life so much that like, I don't need even writing the mm. caption. I'm like, I don't need to explain any of this to anybody. Like I have nothing. Yeah. Like I don't need to prove this. I'm having a good time, you yes. know? And yeah. so anyway, but then also if you're in your business there, then you know, there's just so many, I think everyone's relationship with the internet gets to be uniquely their own. And I don't believe there's like one right way to do it. Right. So why do you choose to show up there? Let me start there. I have so much fun making videos. Okay. Like I, if I'm being honest, I have this secret thing where I really want to be a comedian and an actress and like funny. Sounds like it's not a secret anymore. And also this is the very first thing I thought about you when I met you. I was like, (laughs) she's a riot. I literally want to be an actress and I want to make people laugh and I want to bring joy and Social media is a literally I get to live my dream through social media. I get to make funny videos and I don't feel forced at all. If I don't want to post, I'm not going to post. Yeah. If I don't have anything to post, I don't post. But like there will be days when I'm just going through and all of these ideas are popping up and I write funny captions to these videos and I post them. And typically they are regarding water. They're also a lot of times about how tall I am because that's real life and people make the funniest comments. Yeah. And I'm like, I got to share this, you know? So it's like, I share real life things and I share what I'm passionate about. Like I literally am obsessed with water. I'm obsessed with volleyball. I'm obsessed with fitness. I'm obsessed with my faith. I'm obsessed with being tall. Like those are all things that I love to share. Mm -hmm. And I just, I just released the idea of, I need to be at a certain place in my life or I need to show up a certain way in order to be successful. Uh, My gift, and I'm so grateful for it, is the fact that I literally don't care what people think about what I do for work or myself. Like, I just laugh. That's it. I love it. (laughs) I think that's great. That's the secret. The more that you can, yeah, I, I think one of my own personal this which sounds like you can't relate to this and I love that but I know that a lot of people can is just like there was so much fear around like I created content big like early stages uh online for a brand not for my own personal whatever and then my own personal account grew and then I was like okay now I'm terrified Like I did not like, there was no invitation sent, but it's an open account. But then there was the, my ego liked being fed and it was being fed like crazy. So like yet again, the delusion, I'm not even aware that this is going on and my ego over there. is just like a gorilla, like just beating its chest. And then I experience hardship in life and I'm like, I don't have anything to say. And then I come into Mm. a new profession and everybody's going to think I'm an imposter or like I have an imposter syndrome. Everybody's going to think that like I, well, and what happens whenever I finally say something that, you know, and I say all the time when it comes to like trolls, haters, I'm like, yeah, if you like comment that I'm too orange today, like, I guess I put on too much fake tan. Who cares? You know, like don't care. Like those types of things or there was a piece of content that went viral where I just straight up had a camel toe right and like boy that brand like ran with that one and it was everywhere for a while and I was like can't even be mad at y'all it's pretty obvious um and so those things have nothing to do with my character or my passions so those are pretty easy for me but the ones that I do genuinely like have fear around is like I care so much about health and so choosing to share like it wasn't even that long ago when I finally shared my very first like movement tutorial Mm. and I was terrified because I'm like what happens if someone says that I did it wrong and then I what if I find out that I didn't do it just right and what if I put out information that wasn't optimal and like all of that stuff is just anyway it's just I, I think it's a very real human experience but what's also really cool is that like um you know, if you're trying to please everyone, then like it's one, it's not going to work for you. And it's not even like, it's literally not going to resonate with anybody else. So if you have an opinion, that's 
probably a good thing. Uh, I, I don't know. I just, I love playing with all of that. And then I think yeah. that because when I look at your account, what you're telling me now, like I believe you because you just show up as yourself as you see fit and it's obvious. And so that's an attractive trait. Like there people show up on your page because they just want to like hang out with a relatable human. That's probably yeah. going to make them laugh. And you also educate them along the way. Yep in your own way. Yeah. And so just knowing what your creation process looks like, I think is very inspiring to know yeah. that you seem to feel a sense of peace around it because I think this, a lot of people would love to be able to do that and maybe the like encouragement to lean in a bit more. Yeah. To, I don't know. I mean, I definitely like, obviously I run my business from my page and so I definitely have like goals and tactics. Like my goals with my, with my content is I'm either entertaining, I'm empowering, or I'm educating. So you have your pillars. Yes. Yeah. And if I'm doing, if I can do all three of those, that's great. And then of course I, my pillars are like health, fitness, volleyball, water, like let's just say that. Um, and so I have my tactics, but I actually, I mean, when I was first posting, my fear was around what are people going to think of me? Which is crazy because I was showing up online. I was showing up bald. Like I did not care. I was laughing at that whole journey. But with the water stuff, I was like, what are people going to think of me? They're going to think it's a scam. There's no, this is too good to be true. There's no way this is real. I didn't share it and I didn't show up. And I had to go back to how selfish of you not to talk about it after what it did for you. Yep. And that is where that's what got me through the posting and like being scared to post and being scared of what people thought about me. And mm -hmm. I didn't want them to think that I was a scammer. And yeah, I always just had to go back to how selfish of you not to share after what I did for you. And it gave me purpose. Mm -hmm. It gave me purpose and it gave me conviction. And it also gave you outright financial freedom because girl, you're making money. hundred percent. Like yeah. I literally, I'm literally living my dream job. My dream job was if I could eat healthy, work out, travel the world, change the world and make people laugh so hard they could be their pants. Those, that was my dream job. I always said that when I was like in college and I literally get to do it mm -hmm. and it's a gift. Like I, I love getting the text messages from people who drink the water and they're like, wow, I literally always struggle drinking water or people who are going through chemo who cannot drink water because the taste makes them nauseous. So they just don't drink it. You have to drink water, especially during chemo. Otherwise it sits in your kidneys and liver and then it be causes issues. Mm -hmm. So selling to someone who's maybe going through chemo and they're like, wow, I can actually like, I want to drink this water. Like yeah. it's, that is like the why. I think it's really cool. And I think I don't even need to ask any other questions there because I think that the key pull away there is just simply like, how dare you. And I think you even apply that even if you don't necessarily like, okay, so yes, the, mach the machine, but like you choosing to share your faith is yet again, exposing a vulnerability of people are not going to yes. agree with you and you choose to do it anyway. Yeah. Um, and, and I would imagine it's probably a similar sentiment of like, I have to be, I like, I can't yeah. just keep this to myself. Like God's done so much for me. I'm going to like scream from the rooftops about it. Yeah. And I, but I think that's for everyone is like, you have to have the conviction to show up on your own social media because everyone has a gift. Yeah. Everyone has a gift. What someone has to say is important. Everyone deserves to be heard. Like all of those things, even if you're not running your business from social media, mm -hmm. like you are important mm -hmm. and what you have to say is important mm -hmm. and you like should show up because someone else out there is probably going to resonate with what you're going through. This makes me think right before this, I was in the sauna with this woman who like, she literally like her physique. I will, I, I got to find her social media okay. after this anyway. So I will do that with you. Um, I'm not, I don't want to call it out yet. Cause I don't want to like, I don't know her, yeah. but I did just ask her first and last name and I'm gonna find her anyway. Um, and we were just talking, she's been a fitness professional for a while. Um, it sounded like for a long time and like, she has a physique that I'm like, and she, so we were just talking and I mentioned the podcast and, and so she asked what it was and then she was like, well, I've thought about it too, but you know, who even cares what I have to say or whatever. And I'm like, I look at you and I'm curious what you have to say. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yes. I literally don't even know you, but your physique tells me that I'm curious about you, man. And that's like, some people just need to be empowered. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that's one of the things that you want to do on social media is like empower people to feel like they have something to say that's yeah. important when that's... I look and I'm like no joke like I mean I don't even I, like you figured out something that the world yes. is literally desperate for so like even if it's I'm like spread <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about that more too yeah um, no <laughs> but it's just uh I don't know it's cool okay 
I love that. Is there anything else that you wanted to share here that we did not get to? I know. I have no idea. How long has okay. it been? Forever. Hour 40. Uh, I say forever. I'm having a great time. I, know, I also will just like literally like, okay, and now we're in the vehicle and we're going to go Ooh. really far. Yep. No. Are you taller than your boyfriend? Oh, I love this for us. Uh, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> well, and I say that, you no. I'm actually oh. not. I know. Well, so did oh. you see? He just made a post and it like th- went off. Um, it was the illusions, the yes. museum of illusions. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, "Is your because all of his friends from back home and even people here like that's like the f- when I first came into his life, it was the first question from everyone was like he went home to Why visit that- like last Thanksgiving. Yeah, and people were like, "So is she taller than you?" And he's like. No, but he's like an inch taller than me. So we're like, we look very yeah. the same height, right? Um, but Why it, is that the first question though? Every time I'm like, oh, I have a boyfriend. They're like, is he taller than you? And I'm like, what? It's so funny. I think it's funny because I'm like, honestly. And so we've had real conversation around this. Cause then I'm like, at what point would the disparity have been an actual problem? Like, cause I'm like, yeah. I honestly think if you had been genuinely shorter than me, like, I don't think like I, I first got really attracted to you for your brain. So then I'm trying to be honest and be yeah. like, would there have been some point at which it would have been like, mm, I don't know. I haven't, uh, thankfully we don't have to go down that road, but either yeah. way, like I couldn't be bothered about that, like at all. Um, but no, he's, t- he isn't as shallow than me. So he, he's taller than me, but just barely. Oh. And we, so he d- made that post and it's just so funny because people eat it up. Like no, the short King so comment fun. is yes! so good. And yet like, and it's, he's, it's also just cause he's so dense. And so he looks he even looks shorter shocking. because yeah. he's, he's wide as all get out. Yeah. Um, and because so he's like probably like five eight so and like two oh five yeah D- just oh, wow. a dense muscle right yeah yeah i mean he's also been training just a since, brick he's been training lifting weights since he was five he's been doing karate since he was three and a bunch of other sports so he was like in sport his whole life too yeah and took this physique building thing to like the you know but yeah. it's also really encouraging because you can take it really far if you want yeah anyway we like i love to play up the short king thing with him like i'm like this is funny well, let's lean in yes um and even though it's i don't know that it's actually true for him because i don't think that that's like that doesn't actually qualify but he looks like it yeah he does i'll be honest i i definitely yeah i thought he was you short. thought he was shorter <laughs> no that's my bad okay but your boyfriend is a little bit short. and here's what's great about it like your boyfriend's tall no <laughs> He's literally tall. Like he is considered tall. He's six one. Yep. I'm just six four. Yep. Like I'm so tall. Yep. Was that? Did, has he expressed any sort of any? Like he said from the jump, like he thought that you were tall and that was cool, right? Yes. However, he also did admit he was like, "Ooh, is she too tall for me?" And he would make jokes, like enough to finally I was like, "Hey, is this?" a problem for you because if it is an insecurity for you then we should just stop it here because it will become a problem yeah as it does like so like let's just like I'm concerned because you're making enough jokes yeah and like to be honest it's making me feel a little insecure so like is this an issue because if it is like let's snip it like let's cut it right here well and that's what I was about to ask too um one of the things of I, I actually have that down but it didn't feel like as <laughs> paramount as all of these other topics but i did have curiosity because it's almost annoying because i would imagine it's something that you don't escape in any interaction you have like i doubt that you get to get out of a conversation that lasts more (laughs) than three minutes without having to talk about your height that's and so that probably maybe to some degree could be like maybe we could not today i don't know yeah Yes. It's like, do we, do we have to make the height comments today? And here we are literally in the moment, but I'm so <laughs> grateful you brought it up. So <laughs> um, here's what I do want to know. Did you, were there times which you resented your height? Are you now like, do you like your height? Does it, is it like goes day by day? Like, cause obviously it was in sport advantageous. Yes. But that doesn't mean that in life with boys, with whatever else that it was that way. Uh, no, not at all. Uh, clothes too. I oh gosh yeah yeah. I was so naive to it though because of sports. Okay, like and that's where my obsession lied. So with boys, it was like cute, whatever. They're shorter than me, but like I didn't really care. You know, um, for example, my like one of my first boyfriends was five ten and I was six four, but I just like didn't even think twice about it. Yeah, and that's just that's never been a thing for me. Obviously, I want someone who isn't like tiny tiny compared to me, right? However, I would so much rather date 
a wonderful human than be like, ooh, I'm counting you out because you're three inches shorter than me. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Even though you treat me like an absolute queen, it's not going to cut it. Mm -hmm. Like there's no way. Um, Yeah, I've always loved my height, I think because of sports and because I like my family is taller, but I just, I, my stature was always, oh wow, I'm tall and I'm going to like beat someone's ass because I'm tall and like I crush at volleyball. Yeah. Like that's where that was. So it just sounds to me too. Like this is one of the things that because I didn't grow up in sports, I definitely having children is something I would like to do. And I'm uh, not soon, but I do want to do that anyway. And I'm excited to, the, for the sport journey, assuming that that does come to fruition in my mm-hmm. lifetime. I'm excited about that because also I look at someone like you, or I look at someone like Jimmy who started the karate at five, the, um, weightlifting, or I'm sorry, at three, the weightlifting at five, like so young and, and the tools that's given him for life. And then yes. I look at like, for you, this self-worth and this, narrative that you were able to take into like this hardship at age 26 that most people won't experience maybe until if ever they're 70 you know what I mean yes all of it seems to me that there were so many tools packed into this athletic journey to deal with life yep and so yet again what's great about that then on the flip side is I didn't go to gym till I was in my 20s it took me uh, I think six years of showing up there to finally let somebody tell me that I could be okay at something and believe them. So it took me a long time Mm -hmm. to finally buy into like, maybe I could not suck because for the whole, uh, I guess six years prior to that, I was pretty solidly convinced that I was always going to be bad at stuff because I'm not an athlete was my narrative. Uh, But now, oh my gosh, existing in those rooms, what it has done for my quality of life. And like, I think that I'll always have so much gratitude for, I came up in CrossFit, right? Like that's where I got started. And I don't know that I ever would have gone and sought how to Olympic weightlift and how to do gymnastics and how to, you know, whatever. Like I was just like, I don't know. I just like want to have a better quality of life. And that was just the place that people went. And I eventually, and I would like, I've told it many times before I would drive around the block and drive home. I was like, they belong. I don't, I had to get through all that. Right. Yeah. But now I get to show up in any freaking room and feel really confident that like this body is going to do whatever it's asked to be done. Like, yes. I'm, I have full faith that this thing, if I need to call upon it to do something right now, it's yes. got it covered. Yeah. And so like, what a gift of being an athlete. And if you could say anything, if I could say anything like to anyone, like there's no reason that you can't just decide halfway through your lifetime or more that I'm going to finally begin to identify as an athlete. Cause I didn't yep. start to do it till I was damn near 30 and I got a whole runway ahead of me. So yep. wherever anybody is like, why not lean into that? Why not just switch the narrative? If you've not had that narrative, is it working for you? And could you yeah. afford to swap to a different one? I don't know. Yeah. I think being an athlete. Yeah. If anything, it's just showed me how incredible and miraculous the human body is. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it prepared me for, my life and cancer, like all of the, the small injuries that felt so big Mm -hmm. when they happened. Mm -hmm. And then being diagnosed with cancer, I was like, that puts, puts that broken foot into perspective. You know, it's like, yeah, it, it, it definitely prepared me for life and continues to do so. Mm -hmm. Okay. I love that. All right. We round out the show with three things that you're grateful for. My health water love it if if you didn't say that i was gonna be like offended <laughs> <laughs> my health water and my faith okay nice and simple yeah. um my gratitudes we do it this is a reciprocal thing uh the sure. gratitudes for me today are going to be i got to go to an anniversary party of a group that i'm a member of uh last night and i just have a lot of appreciation that this group was formed all of these years ago, decades ago now, and that I just get to plug into a system and be a part of it. So that was a celebration last night. That's just like, uh, yeah, I got to hear somebody like speak and tell a beautiful story. And so I'm just grateful that things community exists. Uh, I am grateful for, let's see here. My aunt and uncle came to visit this past weekend and that was really special. I think, yeah, like to, to put more value in relationships with family is something I continue to lean further into and, um, 
it's not ever a decision that I regret. And yeah. so that's cool. And then the third thing that I'm grateful for today is, uh, 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 you, sorry. It just is. Oh, I know it's cute. such an easy grab. You're so but cheesy. No, I, love you. I know. I'm sorry. It's just, um, <laughs> from the jump, you make me laugh. And if there's anything that makes like, there are some cool features about humans and yours definitely like a standout is that, you brighten a room and because you bring laughter and that's a really special thing to, to have. So that's it. We love it. Humor is the best medicine. It's real good. I love it. Uh, okay. We, Oh, y- I'll put in the show notes in the description as well, your social media, as well as what I- you'll give me a link for your, in case anybody wants to like look further into the machines. And oh all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, if you want to follow her on Instagram, I'll have that there. If you want to connect with her more about literally anything, I'll make sure that that's in the description. Just get me that. Yeah. Perf. Okay. Um, and if you want to inquire about my coaching, I coach nutrition, I coach, coach movement. I offer group and one-to-one online as well as in person here in Austin, Texas. I train it on at gym. And so if any of those things are of interest to you, then please connect with me and I'll put that in the description as well. Cute. Yeah. Okay. We just hope that you choose to have a beautiful day.